Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 16th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, now that the vote count is nearing the end, we talk about where those looking in the upcoming session for deep budget cuts should focus their energy. Second, we review last Friday's Institute of the North discussion on constitutionalizing permanent fund draws and what that may portend for the PFD. And third, we talk about what we have learned this election cycle about the issue of money in Alaska politics. And now, let's join Michael. So let's get, let's dive down into this. Uh, the new legislative results as they sit right now, of course, we won't have confirmation uh, and there'll be another dump tomorrow and then it'll be certified next week. But uh, what's your take and uh, what's your take on conservatives being concerned about money? Let's uh, let's talk about all that with number one. Well, I think uh, I think the the results are are fairly clear now that there's not going to be a 21 plus 11 uh, majorities in the Senate and the House, or the House and the Senate, rather, uh, that are going to be completely in sync with with the governor. I think that uh, the governor is going to have um, a, a difficult time pushing positive legislation, pushing things like, uh, oh, downstreaming or upstreaming the, uh, the, the oil property taxes from the boroughs and uh, and other things that he might want to do that take affirmative uh, legislation. What also is clear, though, to me uh, as I as I look at the numbers, is the governor is going to have 16 uh, that are that 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 are supportive of the types of cuts uh, that he uh, proposed in 2019, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, perhaps even deeper cuts. And the significance of 16. Uh, is that that's the that's the number required uh, combined from both bodies uh, to to uphold any vetoes. So the question to me is going to be how does how does the governor does the governor and if and if he does how does the governor use that 16 uh, to to help uh, further his agenda of uh, of getting the state's uh, budget. Uh, back into balance. I think that it gives him negotiating power and 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 those in the 16, there's actually 16 plus, I've got about 20 right now, 20, 20 or 21. Those, those in that core group, I think it gives them the power to say, look, uh, you know, we're going to sit here at the end and be prepared to back up the governor's vetoes. Um, we don't think you can override it. Um, and so let's negotiate on, on where we're going to land. I don't think the governor can achieve everything he wants to because he's not going to have 21 plus 11. Uh, but I do think he can achieve a lot by using the, uh, the power of the 16. He also is going to be close. I don't think he's going to get there, but he's going to be close to having uh, 6 plus 11, uh, 6 in the Senate and 11 in the House, which is the critical number for uh, rejecting uh, uh, CBR uh, maneuvers with the CBR, uh, including the reverse sweep, uh, and so that's going to give him potentially some addition. If he can get the six plus eleven, that's going to potentially give him some additional negotiating leverage. But but I but set, setting that aside, I think he is going to have the sixteen. The question is going to be how how is he going to use that? 
Um, is he going to play hardball? The, the, the counter, the counterbalance to that is going to be, uh, the recall petition and whether, whether he, what he does ignites the recall, uh, reignites the recall petition. Um, and so the, the question is going to be, how is he going to use that? Uh, and, and is he going to use it in a way, is he going to play hardball with it in a way that, that achieves, a not insignificant amount uh, of the agenda he laid out uh, in 2019. We're not going to know that for a while. The the, the place that we're going to learn that uh, with some with some significance is going to be when his budget comes out the first part of December. Um, and when the, and and if he's going to go down this road of using the 16, um, then if that's going to show up in his proposed budget. If it were me. Uh, what I would want to do uh, if that budget announcement is come out uh, to announce my budget and have those and have those 16 plus arrayed behind me and say, look, this is where we're going. Uh, we're open to negotiation. We, we want to get a final fiscal solution. Uh, but this is this is where we're going. Um, whether he does that, uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of, of, of river, water, whatever to cross before. Uh, before we get to that point, but I think I think that's what this election is, has given him. It's given him 16. It's not given him 21 plus 11. On the on the Wednesday morning after the election, uh, you could have you would have thought that it was going to give him the 21 plus 11, but it hasn't. Uh, but it's given him the 16. The question is now is now how does he use that 16? And I mean, do you think that these majorities? are going to uh, form uh, easily. I mean, I think the Senate one is the one that's most up in the air right now. Um, and, I mean, even the House is kind of edgy. I mean, how do you think that these, the, you know, how do you think these majorities form? Is there going to be a tough fight here? Or is it going to be, you know, is it going to be more smooth sailing for one one chamber or the other? I don't, you know, I, I think that's up in the air. I, I They may wait until after his budget comes out. They may wait wait till see... You know what what it is he's going to put out there, or at least until it becomes clear what he's going to put out there in terms of a budget. Um, I think that could affect uh, the formation of the majorities uh, in both bodies. So we may be at this, we may be talking about this or thinking about this for a while before uh, before it actually happens. But but I'm I've come to the point where I'm prepared to see, um, frankly. You know, I'm sort of steeled to 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 see uh, bipartisan majorities in both uh, in both the Senate and the House. Uh, the numbers, the, the the core conservatives get close. Core fiscal conservatives get close in the Senate. They get to nine, uh, but I don't I don't see them getting uh, getting over that over that hump um, unless there's you know some some really some some intra body compromises that go on uh, fairly quickly. Uh, in the House, uh, uh, the numbers are still. I mean, we've still got three races that are that are yet to be called. Most importantly, Lance Pruitt's race against uh, uh, Snyder, um, and uh, that's going to be potentially up in the air for 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 a bit longer. But frankly, I'm I'm prepared to see. A, a, I've, I've steeled myself to see a bipartisan majority. Uh, in the House as well, but that's the the point I want to make is that's not the end of the calculus. Shouldn't be the end of the calculus. the The end of the calculus should be the governor's got 16. What's he going to do with them? What I mean, you've got people like Ron Gillum, you've got people like Rob Myers, you've got people like Roger Holland, James Kaufman, others who have run essentially to say, look, we're going to be we're going to be supportive of the governor. Right. That's that was sort of Tom McKay. That was sort of their entire. Uh, their entire platform. We're going to be supportive of the governor. Right. Team Dunleavy, so to speak. Right. Yeah. So so it's going to be, he's going to have 16 of those, um, 16 plus of those. What's he going to do with them? Um, it is, it's it's an well, asset that he's got uh, and and he needs to get, he should get something out of it. Uh, right. the, que the question is how and, and, and what. Well, and I think that leads us really to the main question, the elephant in the room that I think many people, people are asking and even in the chat room. Are we even sure that he's going to cut? Are we even sure that he's going to produce a budget that is uh, has any you know any kind of fiscal restraint in it, um, or is this recall being held over his head going to be the bludgeon that they're going to continue to beat him down with and and basically try and keep him in line? 
Or does he go back to the 2018 mantra of we've got to cut and live within our means? Uh, I think, you know, I, I've used the analogy before the rowboat. you got a rowboat with 60 people in it and you got one guy at the tiller. They could pull in all directions, but the guy at the tiller still has more power in directing the where the boat's going. He's got to direct the boat in the right direction to begin with. He does. Um and 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 the recall has has proven to be a powerful force, uh, sort of pushing back, uh, sort of pushing back on him. But here's what what's happening this year is that we're out of savings, so it's he, he we we've got to come to some uh, uh, fork in the road. We either go down the fork that. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're never going to get this under control and we're just going to tax somebody. We're either going to tax future Alaskans in terms of by draining down the ERA, or we're going to tax current you know, Alaskans by terms in, in terms of just eliminating the PFD, or we're going to tax current Alaskans more broadly and equitably. Uh, but, but that's sort of, that's sort of the fork in the road, uh, that he's at. And I, you know, <laughs> you've got people like, you know, Rob Myers and James Kaufman and Roger Holland and Tom McKay and others who, who ran explicitly on the, I'll do whatever the governor tells me to do. And I'm a fiscal conservative and I hope he tells me to, to cut spending. And, uh, and, and, you know, and voters elected them. They kicked out Kathy Giesel. They kicked out uh, Jennifer Johnson. They kicked out John Coghill uh, electing candidates who were saying exactly that. Um, so there's a, there's an expectation a fairly broad expectation, I would say, in, in at least in certain parts of the state, that the governor follows through on that, and the governor uses that power that uh, uh, that they gave him by electing legislators who said that. So, I there, there's certainly there's certainly a, a, a two two factors in there. I mean, the the factor that he's got these people, he's got the 16, he's got the asset, uh, uh, use it. Uh, there's also the factor of the, of the recall petition, but if the governor, if, if the governor is going to be the guy that we thought we elected in 2018, if he's going to be that guy, he needs to use that asset. Now, you know, people need to be prepared that 16 isn't going to give you everything you want for. It's not going to give you, you know, $2 billion or three or, or two, $2.3 billion in cuts, which is to get us down to what our traditional revenues are. It's not going to get you upstreaming of of the 440 million in in property taxes because that takes that takes 21 plus 11. Uh, it's not going to get you everything you want, but it can get you it can get you a lot. Right. I mean, it can get you uh, uh, upstream half those revenues, and I won't cut spending uh, by by a certain amount. It can get you those sorts of trades, um, and he and he needs to. I think in the end, he uses that asset. Uh, uh, for some trading bait, uh, the question is, you know, how good a trader is he, I guess? How, how, how good a deal can he cut? Right. Uh, final question before we go to break, and then we'll get a tease. Um, do you think the binding caucus is broken? Do you think it's busted? Or is it still the possibility that a binding caucus will be utilized in either chamber this year quickly here? Oh, in all honesty, I think there's a binding. If we go to buy, if we go to bipartisan majorities, there's a binding caucus in both in both bodies. Um, and I and I truly, th I've, as I said, I've steeled myself to prepare myself for the fact that we have bipartisan majorities in both in both houses. Supportive of the governor isn't always representative of the people, says Catherine. Well, true, I guess, uh, unless uh, I guess overall, unless you're saying. Uh, that the people want more spending, I guess, is the uh, is the question there. Uh, James says the non-binder faction in the House will be a critical component in the formation of the majority. And I would agree with that. I mean, I think even if you have a bipartisan coalition, um, those people are going to be pretty strident about not having it be, I mean, having a caucus, yes, but maybe uh, either modified uh, binding or non-binding in total. I think that's going to be a big deal. Mm, I can get I can get to 22, depending upon the outcome of some of these races. I can get to 22, that's that looks a lot like, in the House that looks a lot like the bipartisan majority uh, last year, and that bipartisan majority was a binding caucus. I mean, yes, there are certainly uh, uh, non-binding caucus opponents of binding caucus uh, in the House, but 
uh, I'm not sure they end up as part of uh, as part of the majority. They may be they may they may be their they may be the minority. So uh, yeah, that's cert- there's certainly a faction there, but I'm I'm not sure it uh, it uh, is, is enough of a faction to to prevent the formation of a bipartisan majority that that uses a binding caucus. Michael says, I predict not much of a change with the Biden administration taking over. The state will pimp out uh, hat in hand for federal money and pork to help the upper crust and special interest to contain the to sustain and control the direction of spending. We, the people, will still get the shaft. That's my prediction. Prove me wrong. What do you think with the change in administration? What do you think? Do you think it'll mean something along that lines? Oh, I think the I think the <laughs> I think the federal government is going to be as divided uh, as as the state government. I mean, it's it's we're going to have a Democrat president, uh, uh, probably still a Republican Senate, uh, and a Democrat House, and the Republican Senate is going to be they're they're going to flip back to their uh, to their very uh, uh, fiscally conservative uh, uh, the, <laughs> that that part of their persona. Uh, and I'm not sure we're going to have a whole lot of federal uh, uh, spending that's going to that's going to try to influence the uh, try to influence the states. So I'm not that, that I, I'm not I, I don't I don't think that's going to be a big factor. Uh, here's our favorite listener, Harold. He says Moderna has a 95 percent vaccine. So does Pfizer. He says, are you ready for 60 to 80 dollar a barrel oil? What, what, what say you to that? Sure, I'd love sixty to eighty dollar barrel oil, but I'd, but, but Harold may be the only person in the world predicting that. Yeah, I mean, I mean just... ca- causation and and, and everything else. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, I look like budget. I look at it like budget cuts are a tax on the government. So right now, the government is saying, "Screw you! The people won't tax us. We're going to make sure to get. We're going to make sure the people get taxed one way or the other." Never the government, which is essentially what they've been doing since they first started taking the permanent fund and then refusing to look at any cuts in their own uh, in their own right, in their own backyard. Right. Yeah, exactly right. But now what, what I'm suggesting is this election, th- this is a different legislature, even even though it may end up with bipartisan majorities. Uh, yeah, it's a different legislature coming in than 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 we had the last two years. It's the conservative core is bigger. Uh, it's it's not big enough to, to form a, a majority, but the conservative core is bigger, and it's probably more. Again, you look at the McKays and the Kaufmans and the Hollands and the and the Myers. It, I think it's more supportive of the governor. The conservative core is more supportive of the governor than we had the last uh, the last legislature. So it's it's a it's a different legislature. I think it I think it has the potential to give the governor more backbone if he's willing to willing to use the power of the sixteen. Uh, I think it's I think it's willing to give the governor uh, more backbone. So, um, y- y- you know, you've y- you got to look at you've got to look at, at the cards you've been dealt. And I think the governor has in, in terms of ha- in terms of looking at it from the perspective of 16, I think the governor has a better hand than he had the last legislature. And do you think those 16 back up any kind of uh, kill on the reverse sweep or anything else? We've got about 45 seconds here. Yeah, it takes it takes six plus eleven. Um, it's not, that's not a combined vote. It's an individual vote. Take six plus 11 to, uh, to, to back the governor up on the reverse sweep. I'm not sure that, that he's going to have that in the Senate, frankly. Um, he may, he may have it in the house, but I'm not sure he's going to have that in the Senate. Uh, number two is the question on the, uh, permanent fund and a constitution give us a quick tease here. So there was an interesting series of, of, uh, webinars, uh, events last week sponsored by the Institute, hosted by the Institute of the North, uh, that, that really was intended as a deep dive uh, into the permanent fund. It was in part, um, it, was, it was mostly focused on, you know, uh, limiting takes by this generation and leaving money for future generations. But there was a very interesting session on Friday uh, that really talked about is there it was whether whether there was enough support to constitutionalize the the permanent fund the 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 POMV approach to the permanent fund, and that that ended up in a discussion that I think is is very interesting from the standpoint of the PFD as well. So that that's the second segment that we'll talk about. The Constitution and the PFD it's one of the first pillars of the things that we see, say need to be uh, dealt with. Of course, the spending cap in the Constitution, but also the PFD in the Constitution is kind of the second leg of that stool 
What are the chances, in your opinion, as you look at this, what do you think the likelihood of this going on is? It, it was there, so there was a session last week, uh, a series of sessions, noontime sessions uh, put on by the Institute of the North. Um, if, if people didn't watch it, it's it's up on it was it was streamed Facebook Live. And so it's up on the Institute of the North Facebook page an hour a day uh, over the lunch hour. Uh, it's well worth uh, uh, going through going through that series. Uh, the series was largely pitched. To, to, to convince people that we need to incorporate POMV or some form of POMV uh, in, in some form of for permanent solution uh, to draws on the permanent fund to protect uh, the permanent fund for uh, the benefit of the, of the permanent fund for, for future Alaskans. Um, and the first four days of the, of the five-day series was really spent sort of generating uh, pushing that, pushing that, that, that boulder uh, uphill, uh, and building the momentum for you know, the the background and the whys and the wherefores about why you need to do that. And then on Friday, Friday was sort of the the culmination of all that, uh, and it was a discussion uh, about uh, uh, putting that putting the OMV some form of of protection uh, in the Constitution. Interesting panel. It was Eric Wolferth, uh, uh, longtime uh, fiscal guru, uh, uh, longtime lawyer in the state, uh, Charles Wolferth's father. Um, uh, Eric used to serve on the on the permanent fund board. Uh, Eric said uh, was a commissioner of revenue, if I recall correctly, uh, back in Governor Egan's uh, administration. University of Virginia law graduate, which is why I like Eric a lot. Uh, so Eric was on the panel. Pat Pitney was on the panel. Uh, Rick Halford was on the panel, and Larry Persley was the was the moderator of the panel. And it was really, I mean, it was really pitched towards. Uh, uh, this 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 notion of putting POMV or something in the Constitution to limit the ability of the legislature to to drain the ERA or to do other things that impair the value of the permanent fund for future generations. Rick Halford uh, was there to talk about you know, including the PFD as part as part of the as part of it, uh, but he was outnumbered. Uh, I mean, it's I think it's fair to say that given their druthers, Pat, Eric, and Larry would. Uh, would prefer to leave the PFD, the question of the PFD, to individual legislatures uh, as opposed to putting it in the Constitution. Rick was there to pitch it. But what was really interesting uh, is when we went through the discussion of would that pass, would a limitation on the uh, permanent fund uh, dividend, would a limitation draw from the permanent fund pass uh, in the end, um, to a person. Uh, they agreed that it would take putting the PFD, including the PFD, as part of the constitutional provision to pass it. It would, it would, you would need to have something like the PFD. You would need to have a constitutional protection for the PFD um, in as part of the uh, final, uh, final const proposed constitutional amendment uh, to pass it. And I, and I think that was an excellent, uh, an excellent outcome. Of, of this week-long series and an excellent outcome of the conversation to recognize that the PFD needs to be per, per, making the PFD permanent, protecting the PFD, constitutionalizing the PFD needs to be part uh, of the of the overall uh, overall solution. And um, and 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 I think that I think that was a great discussion uh, to have uh, leading into a session where we may be discussing constitutionalizing. Uh, the permanent fund, um, and and frankly, it made me feel at the end of this conversation, it made me feel a lot more comfortable uh, about about having this conversation about constitutionalizing the permanent fund when there's this when when there at least among these uh, 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 people were was a recognition that 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 constitutionalizing the PFD would have to be part of that. And so, and I think that there there is a a pretty strong feeling in all the people that I. Uh, interviewed anyway, most of the conservatives that were going into the races, that this is that the constitutionalization of the PFD and the formula is is at least one of their top priorities. You know, probably behind the spending cap and and the cutting of the of the uh, 
uh, of the budgets and everything else. But that was definitely part of their toolkit. So I think this will probably be a larger component than many who are opposed would like to see. Yeah. And, and, and what's, you know, there is going to be a push to constitutionalize. I mean, there is a, is a real concern about draining, draining the ERA. Uh, I have that concern. There's a real concern about, about what we're doing to future generations, what this generation is about to do to future generations. And I think there will be a push, uh, uh, to constitutionalize, uh, the limit, the draws, uh, that can be made, uh, from the permanent fund in a way that, that, uh, that protects, uh, protects future generations. So it, 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 but, but, but there's a deal. I mean, there's a deal to be made. I, I don't think it, I think it's fair to say that Eric, Larry and Pat were, were, were not enthusiastic about including constitutionalizing the PFD uh, as part of that. But I think they recognized it was, it, it needed to be a component. And I, and I think that's, I, I, I think that's great. I, 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 I think that there's a deal to be made here between, between those who want to protect the PFD first and those who want to protect the, the the value of the permanent fund uh, for future generations. I think there's a deal to be made that was really captured uh, in that Friday conversation, and and my perspective would be I'd like to I would like to see that go forward. I'd like to see that 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 deal made pass through the legislature as a constitutional amendment and put on the ballot uh, for 2022 for uh, for the people to to, to vote on. But it's going to need to include both parts. Those who think. That we're just going to be able to constitutionalize the PFD uh, uh, and and not you know and and not uh, agree to some form of POMV in the Constitution, they're going to be disappointed. Just as those who think that they're going to be able to constitutionalize some form of a POMV and not include the PFD, they're going to be disappointed. It's going to take both components, uh, I think, to uh, to work uh, to get the necessary support. Um, and I think uh, it's going to take both both components are going to be on the ballot uh, if it's going to make it out of the legislature. Let's move on to number three here. We've got about four minutes. Uh, is it time for conservatives to become concerned about money in politics? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, moderate a panel on Thursday uh, that's going to talk about money in politics. Uh, it's going to talk about uh, uh, uh uh, Citizens United, the the amount of, of private money that's come into uh, politics, uh, and frankly, I think it's time to 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 be talking seriously about uh, about an amendment to the Constitution that does something to Citizens uh, Citizens United. What we have, what we saw in this state this last election cycle, was huge amounts of money coming in from the outside. Uh, to affect the election. And frankly, I think a lot of that money that came in from the outside to support the Al Gross campaign, to support ballot measure two, is 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 a major reason why we're seeing uh, uh, the, the, the lack of a conservative core, the lack of a conservative 21 and 11 uh, in, in the legislature. I think we're, we're seeing in the Anchorage results uh, uh, the effect of a lot of outside uh, uh, left side money that came in uh, to push ballot measure two and to and to push uh, push out gross, I think each state needs to be able to this, particularly this state where where you know we're such a small population, our media market is relatively inexpensive, and outside money can go a long way, and outside money comes in for Senate races and, and major ballot races, um, and and I think I think the states need to be able to to define the terms their own terms about how money comes in. That's going to take a constitutional amendment. We're going to talk about it more on Thursday. Uh, you can find out the details on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. But I, th- I think that's an issue that we that we need to start discussing. One of the uh, billionaires that funded Prop 2 was quoted as saying, Alaska is a cheap date. And I think that you are putting paid to that right there. Easy money spent to get something done. I want to expound on that just a little bit, Brad, because, I mean, to me, it was always one of the most you know ironic things in the world that they had all these ads going on out there especially for prop two you know we're going to get dark money out of politics by injecting politics with millions of dollars in dark money but we're going to get dark money out of politics but i mean it really is alaska they're trying to make it a bellwether state for change because it is such a cheap date respectively when you're talking about the number of people versus the size of the media market and everything else, their impressions, their their impressions per dollar was uh, was is just tremendous as far as that goes. 
Yeah, it's it's um, it, Alaska, and we're always going to be subject to this, right? Because because we've got two senators, the the Senate is is closely divided. It's going to be closely divided over the next decade at least, um, and and outside people are going to try to come in uh, and try to influence our Senate races. And and what we've seen is they're dragging along, <laughs> they're dragging along um, uh, local races. Uh, th- this flood of money that's coming into the state is dragging along local races. Now, I would say for the past decade, conservatives have been mostly okay with that because most of the money has been uh, has been uh, uh, conservative money, you know, Koch brothers and and the like. But but we've seen a shift in that. I mean, we saw a shift in that uh, with uh, with the amount of money that came in for the Gross Sullivan race, and and for ballot measure two, which frankly is probably the precursor to the Murkowski race. Uh, in two years, the, one of the big motivations for ballot measure two was to was to set up a situation in which Lisa doesn't have to go through a Republican primary, um, and so we're we're just going to see this 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 ton of money. Ton, what's big for us? I mean, it would be small for Florida, for a media market like Florida, right? But what for Alaska is a ton of money coming in, and just sort of jerking us around. Um, and so I, it, it, it's a states' rights issue. Does, should Alaska have the ability to protect itself against against huge amounts of outside money coming in, sort of dominating our airwaves? And 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 what what became clear during the gross uh, uh, ballot measure two was harvesting votes. I mean, putting boots on the ground, going out and getting absentee uh, ballots uh, into the hands of people to vote who other who otherwise might not. Uh, have voted. So it, are we going to, are we going to be, should we be able to protect ourselves? I think the answer to that is yes. But if we're going to be, we, we've nationalized this issue, Citizens United nationalized this issue. So we can't protect ourselves merely by legislation. It's going to take a U.S. constitutional amendment to to essentially allow the states the right to to protect themselves from from the waves of outside money that are out there. And I think that's something that, frankly, given what we've seen in this election, is something that, that we need to be thinking long and hard about and, and in my opinion, become supportive of. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. we got about two minutes here, Brad. Um, final thoughts for the listeners today, uh, you know, as to where we're going, what we need to be watching for, what we need to be prepared for if we're going through a transition here at the national level and everything else. What should we be looking at? Well, I think we ought to be looking very close to home. Our state is divided, just like Congress is, uh, where we thought on the day after Election Day there might have been a red wave at the state level. It's turned out that, if anything, there was a blue-ish, purple-ish wave. Uh, And so the state legislature is going to be fairly closely divided uh, as well. Uh, As I say, I've steeled myself for likely having bipartisan majorities in, in both bodies. But... We've got 16. The, the governor has got 16 plus, um, and the, and and I think the gov. I think where where we're, where we spend the best time is on giving the governor, supporting the governor to have a backbone to use that asset of the 16 plus uh, to achieve uh, as much as he can of his agenda about uh, cutting state spending and and equitably treating Alaskans by ensuring that a full permanent fund is is distributed to them. Um, he's been given an asset, voters kicked out, voters went to the trouble of kicking out Giesel, uh, Jennifer Johnson, uh, Coghill, they went to the trouble of doing, the Chuck Cop. they went to the trouble of doing that. Now, and they, they went to the trouble of doing that to give the governor an asset. Now the question is, is the governor gonna use that asset uh, for the purpose uh, that uh, that voters uh, created it for him, uh, and I think that's going to be a big question. And I, I, I would urge everybody to spend their time tr- thinking about ways and being supportive of the governor using that asset in a way that gets spending down. If he doesn't use that asset, then then we're going to be we're going to be in serious trouble. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Thank you, my friend. We appreciate you being part of it. Out of Michael, as always, thanks for having. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.